Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. I'm Christine Zernhal. AKA Shep. And I'm Jess Bud. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock. Here on January 24th, 2020. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news show each and every Friday morning. We read all the news. So you don't have to. What's going on, guys? Um, did you guys hear about James Corden and Who? how he doesn't really drive in carpool karaoke? I don't even know who you're talking about what? and what you're talking about. Yeah, no. <laughs> you don't know what is carpool... He, oh, is he one of the um, the royals? No, he's <laughs> a late night guy. Oh. You know carpool karaoke. I, I Is that the one with Paul McCartney on it? There's one with him. Okay, that was a good one. He's not really driving the car, which is like makes sense, but there's a picture of the whole rig and he's being like towed by another car and it's wild. That's great. So what about Ben Bailey? Has anybody got to the bottom of that? I don't know. Is cash that the cash cab? Yeah. <laughs> no? Oh, I never thought of that. He's got to be really driving. He certainly looks like it's good fake if not. Yeah. I mean, he's in New York City. I mean, that's a real deal. I mean, it's dangerous to drive there anyway. You might as well not pay attention and host there a game show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and have flashing lights in your car. Perfect. All right. So Jess, who's our sponsor this week? This week's episode of Marketing O'Clock is brought to you by Hrefs. Whether you work for a big brand, run your own small business, or do freelance work, getting traffic to your website is always an issue. Hrefs is an all-in-one SEO tool set that solves that problem. It gives you the tools you need to rank your website in Google and get tons of search traffic. If you want to learn more, just check out their blog or YouTube channel for step-by-step -step SEO tutorials. And they have a seven-day trial for only $7. Head on over to hrefs.com to sign up today. And today's show is also sponsored by Optio. Optio helps Google Ads managers automate time-consuming manual tasks so they can spend more time on high-level strategy and creative work. Optimize accounts, monitor performance, track budgets, and get alerts when important changes happen. Right now, our listeners and our listeners only can get a six-week free trial of Optio. Head on over to optio.com forward slash S-E-J. That's O-P-T-E-O dot com forward slash S-E-J. S E J to get started. It's better than the 30 days you get if you're not a listener. So head on over and thank you to our sponsors this week. We'll dive into a couple more features a little bit later in the show. And today's top news was described as a quote, decently big SEO change by Greg Finn in our marketing channel. In week. our Slack channel. Yeah. Well, it's it's not like a you know, it, it's big. It's big. Yeah. And it was announced by Danny Sullivan on his at Danny Sullivan Twitter account. And he said that some changes. And clarified yesterday on his at search liaison account. That is so confusing. I thought they were both from the same. Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> they, they, he, it was announced on the at Danny Sullivan Twitter account and then clarified. He should keep it in one place. That's you lose all we the fun. We can get into this later. Okay. You lose all the fun of it. <laughs> so let's my, not my favorite was here. when they when they used to make announcements on the Google Plus, and there were all these different Google Plus accounts. You had to follow all these Google Plus accounts. So now it's just John Mueller, Danny Sullivan, or at Search Liaison. I think it's a bit much. Okay, we'll get into. You that. You know what they can't do? Have a Google Ads Twitter account. Can't support they it. They can't anymore. reply to it. They so still it, have it. Well, it, it is dormant and non-used anymore. People are still tweeting at it, though. Do you People tweet at it every day. Is? No, I don't. I don't want the news. <laughs> okay, what do we got? Okay, so he said, I'm going to just read his quote. If a web page listing is elevated into the featured snippet position, we no longer repeat the listing in search results. This declutters the results and helps users locate relevant information more easily. Featured snippets count as one of our 10 web page listings we show. So there's a lot to unpack there. But Dr. Pete Myers at Dr. Underscore Pete noticed that these featured snippet listings were also appearing on the top of the second page. And he asked Danny about this and Danny replied that that is not by design, it might change. Deduplicating is only about the first page of results. And then as of January 22nd, as Greg said, he said from Search Liaison that this has rolled out globally. Correct. So there's a little bit of breakdown on this and I'm going to do a little bit of beginner stuff then get advanced here on it. So with the featured snippet listings, it's typically what you see show up at the top. There's something that shows up to the right-hand side that people think is a featured snippet but isn't necessarily a featured snippet. It's a snippet-like variant. Yeah, and some people think it's the knowledge panel. Well, it's because Google had said that in previous things, but that's not what it is anymore. Um, so... Now, you used to be able to kind of piggyback 
on having the featured snippet, and then you still would show up in the results pages there. And so you still have a normal listing and then the featured snippet. And so they're taking away, if you're the featured snippet, showing up anywhere else. So that's going to be a downgrade if you had, if you were there previously. So you're just going to lose a listing, right? So that, that sounds good. The question and reason some people are concerned, there's, I guess, a few different iterations, and I'm going to go through those quick. So back in spring of 2017, Ahrefs, the fantastic Ahrefs, <laughs> broke down the average click-through rate of featured snippets in general. Um, when there was no featured snippet, again, this now is almost three years ago, but when there was no featured snippet, 26% of the clicks would go to the first URL shown. When there was a featured snippet, that number dropped from 26% down to 8.6%. And then 19.6% of the clicks go to the natural, quote, search result right below the featured snippet. So according to what Ahrefs report showed, if there was a featured snippet, 8.6% got the featured snippet, 196 got the listing underneath it. And I do that, mm -hmm. but I kind of thought I was the only one. And then I saw this data and I was like, wow, I'm not the only one. I barely read it, even though the text is so much bigger and I go to the first result I automatically. Do I do too. But that's now not the case. Mm -hmm. So now you're not going to show up there, which frust it is frustrating. The whole part of the feature snippet is try to surface information to make it easy, which is great for the user. But it's also, I liked it to your point, being in the actual results as well. And I understand that this is results now and it's all one big thing, I get it. Um, so that's just some historical stuff. That's all we've got. I'm sure the Ahrefs is gonna have some more information hopefully at some point here and we'll see some more on that. But that's a big drop and that's worrisome. So then <laughs> Lily Ray, at Lily Ray NYC on Twitter came through with the world's smallest sample size, <laughs> taking a look at what she had seen on a one day, one day sample size. But the results were a minus 38.6% drop in clicks when this result was removed for some nondescript example. We didn't see the actual case study. Um, additionally, Marie Haynes had a tweet as well that talked about the fact of a specific example where she was ranking number one for eat SEO. Uh, which is, uh, you're not actually eating people, mm -hmm. like eating <laughs> search engine optimizers. It's uh, eat, the EAT acronym. And in this case, there was a fact, there were some, some issues with hers where she jumped with the clicks because they were the feature snippet that was a snippet-like variant on the right-hand side. It's all very confusing. But you can look at the show notes and see everything here today. So people are worried if you're a feature snippet, you're going to have less clicks to your site. And that is a fair fair worry. We'll have to see what the number shows. So There's going to be like workarounds for how to get to number two. <laughs> so that's that's what I've got later in the show is like, what not to, to like, don't do it. Okay. So anyway, to your other point, many people think, and there's problems now understanding what is an ad and what isn't an ad. And with a quick scan, many people think that feature snippets look like an ad. To your point, mm -hmm. that if you were to look quick, from a distance, you'd say, oh, that's the ad right there, not the little thing that looks like the organic results now that are right in the organic results with ad in the favicon. So that's another thing. The third thing are these snippet-like variants that are on the right-hand side of desktop. So if you're a snippet-like variant, you're not technically a feature snippet, but if you're there, you are now also removed from the search engine results pages which is the problem. Danny said that these simple like variants are going away. They're going to be moved in and it's now going to be a featured snippet. So the other issue is those snippet like variants that are in the right hand rail. Those technically are not featured snippets, but in this deduplication process, it will act like a feature snippet. So if you're in the right hand rail, you will then no longer have your listing in the main organic results. You will only be on the right hand rail. Danny also says that this will be going away and it'll be smushed back in to the main search engine results page as a featured snippet. Okay, so are you following? No. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so the other <laughs> issue is that there may be some position changes. We don't know for sure, but average position changes in your search console. If you've got those snippet-like variants. So again, 
if you're in the right hand rail, you used to also show up in the main search results. So you'd be in the right hand rail, maybe you'd be position three. The way that Google Help describes it and the way that things have been is the positions start by going down the main search results. So let's say we've got 10 results showing and the snippet length variant in the right hand rail. It goes all the way down the middle, one to 10, and then the snippet like variant in the right hand rail would be number 11. So does that mean that it's the 11th best result? According to the Google Help documents, you can see that there's, it goes down and it is from your average position report, it would show up if you're number three and then number 11, it historically has shown up as number three. The problem is number three is going away. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a lot of these snippet like variants, you may now show up as number 11. The only issue that confuses us even more is John Mueller said that the rankings are subjective, even though it's objectively stated in the help documents. And we could put that in the show notes too. So it's all a little bit confusing. But And I just feel like saying it's subjective is not what he should be saying no. at all. <laughs> that is literally what he said. And I will pull this up quick to quote specifically. So Adam Gent at a double agent on Twitter said, according to their documentation and their own diagram, it would count as position 11 for a particular query if there are 10 organic links. So position zero to position 11, if I'm reading it right. So then there was a little back and forth. And John said, are you saying the documentation is wrong or that you just don't believe it? How positions are counted is subjective. I don't think there's an objectively correct way to map one dimensional scale to two dimension, dimensional and interactive display. Then why would they put it in their search console tool? That well, it's a help, it's a help document. And if we're talking about Google's ranking, position ranking to show in search console, it isn't subjective because it's objective. You're Google, you've got a help document, you know how to explain this, you've got it clearly going down the middle and then up onto the right hand rail. So it's objective. But anyway, if you see a big <laughs> drop in your average position, you're still there, you're on the right hand rail and it's going away soon. Okay. And this was all handled so poorly. Mm. The, the fact that it came out on Danny Sullivan's personal Twitter account a day before the launch that was on the search liaison Twitter account without having uh, actual article on it and then maybe these articles that are showing are not objective and are actually incorrect this is we we could do better on this Agreed. so let's hope the next one's better let's cross our fingers because this this is just too much something that had a fantastic release from <laughs> google is a new post that came out yesterday a fresh way to revisit your online finds in google search and there are changes coming to collections in search that make it easier to jump back into your task without digging through your search history. And I'm going to read a little quote from Google as to what's happening. Last year, we created activity cards in search to make your search history more useful and to help you pick up where you left off using AI collections in the Google app and mobile app. Now groups, similar pages you visited from search related to activities like cooking, shopping, and hobbies. You can choose to save these suggested collections so you can come back to them later. This sounds to me like Pinterest from Google. Yeah. That you just took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Great minds think alike. There's literally nothing I want about this, less than this. I can't imagine wanting these collections with search. It, it, it to me is the fact that Google has never got social right. Nobody ever wants to use a social network that Google makes from wave to plus to anything they've ever tried is just stunk. And so now it's social network inside of your search. It's crazy. For yourself. Too. For yourself. But here's the other thing. You can share your collections from your search with other people. I don't hate it that much. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm. For the, recipes, that's what Pinterest is for. Did you look at your collections? Because I have two. Do you want to know what they are? Yes. One, recipes. Two, fireplaces. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't, I don't get, I don't get how people need, like we can't handle a URL. We can't handle sharing a URL with people. It's just, I like the idea of 
saving all your recipes together in a recipe board, but not having to look through Pinterest because I don't really like the Pinterest interface. But were bookmarks broken? That's what I guess my question is. Bookmarks are annoying on your phone. I just, I don't, when I think me and my Google search history, not like there's anything crazy in there, but I don't want to be like, hey, you know, my five-year-old has a rash and accidentally like, sent that, <laughs> yeah. send that to somebody. And mine didn't bring up like the Duggars or anything. So I feel like it's, <laughs> yeah, well, doing, <laughs> it's doing more things that are our project or event, not event-based, you know, like things that well, you would want to revisit. So here's another thing I'm jealous about. One of the examples is like people that have their lives together because I clearly don't. They said there's also a new collaboration feature that lets you share and work on a collection with others. For example, if you're planning a party with friends, you might want to share the recipes you're considering or the decorations <laughs> you want to use so you can make a decision together. Party? Friends? <laughs> <laughs> no, like, oh, check out my Google search. I'm searching for this. What are you searching for? Hey, let's collab on our recipes and Google search. Get out of here. Yeah. This is this is insane. Yeah, that example I don't like. I like it for recipes. And anyway, fireplaces. Coming to a Google app near you or the the web version of Google as well. Now it's time for this week's take of the week. This is a hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. We simply deliver the take for your consumption. We give no opinions, we don't influence. You make the call. And this week's take of the week comes from Jeff Chang at Jeff Chang 30. And he makes the statement, if you are a SaaS startup and want to start with ads, I would recommend first doing one, Google search for your company and competitor names. Two, Facebook retargeting, spelled wrong, for site visitors. Everything else will take a lot more effort to have a reasonable payback period. I'm going to nominate this for the dumbest take of 2020 so far. (laughs) If you follow this advice, you are going to be spending ads for your name and your competitor names, but let's, and then you're going to be retargeting. So you're going to get people who are searching for you, get them to the site, and then retarget them back to your site. You're never going to get a single new person to your site other than people that don't even want you. They're looking at competitors. I have a question. (laughs) I'm fired up today, guys. (laughs) I'm fired up. I have a question. So you're a startup. Yes. And people are going to be searching for your brand? Yeah, they had a dream in the middle of the night Mm -hmm. and woke up and said, oh, I'm looking for Saster or whatever. (laughs) That's, a, that's an actual company. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> no one's dreaming like that. Yeah, that, that yep. Insane. Okay. And Facebook, I have been really bothered by their lack of frequency capping lately. And if you're doing retargeting and nobody's on your site, it's just going to spend all your budget on the same people over and over again. Also, if you are doing retargeting, why are you only doing it on Facebook? I, because apparently everything else will take a lot more effort <laughs> to have a reasonable <laughs> payback period. I, I think sometimes effort is good. I, I, I just can't imagine the people that are taking this advice. There were 871 likes on this thing when I oh, saw it. Oh, no. That's a There are lot people of out people. there that are going to be like, I'm going to buy my own name and then I'm going to retarget people. And I've got my ads plan in place for my SaaS product. <laughs> 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 a lot of people retweeting. You want this SaaS, too. you've got SaaS. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, while we're still fired up here, let's get into our ICYMI segment this week. Oh, just something that you might not have seen. <laughs> what right. did we not see this, this week, This week's Greg? ICYMI came as a response from a tweet that Julie F. Bikini at Neptune Moon on Twitter posted when she was talking about why can't you set a monthly budget in Google Ads. There was a lot of great conversation around that. Mm-hmm. I chimed in on the B2B side. Is it super frustrating? is in general, the daily budgets aren't really daily budgets. It's a calculation. And it is so frustrating, especially for people that aren't on all the time. It all goes back to the average number of days in a month. And it is super confusing. It's not even a round number. And you have to try to explain this to people when they see these daily budgets. And it's a huge, huge, huge nightmare. So check out that thread. But in the thread, there is a response by at Amy PPC on Twitter, Amy Middleton Hebden. And she talked about two things. One, that the language there has been clarified on how the budget change has been handled. Again, talking to people about this 30.4 average 
that maxes up for your budgets is very complex. And so in general, it'd be like, well, what is your, your budget? Your, okay, your monthly budget is five grand. Here's how it's going to be calculated on a daily basis. So they clarified that. And then two, Amy said, from the article, let's say you normally spend $304 per month on advertising. That's how Google has now clarified it to describe it. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. So Google updated the example that they gave. And the example is, let's say you normally spend $304 a month on advertising. To figure out your daily budget, you divide 304 by 30.4 to get a daily budget of $10. Shep, have you ever had a client that's like my daily budget is $608? No. That's not the axis that you use to say this is how you solve things. You can tell by this example that this is broken. It's so complicated. Just give I a hate daily it. budget. Why can't we have a daily budget? Because that would just be too easy. Because you would spend less. That's why. It's because <laughs> you would spend less. I'm all sorts of fired up this week. <laughs> okay. So great job at Amy PPC in finding that example of that fellow advertiser spending 304 bucks a month. Now it's time for this week's lightning round. Pew, pew. At this point in the show, we split up our content into three parts. Paid organic, and social. This week's paid lightning round is brought to you by Optio. Optio makes managing Google Ads accounts simple and efficient. It automates time-consuming manual tasks so you can spend more time on dividing your budgets by 30.4 or just different strategic and creative work. Whether you work in an agency with a large number of accounts or if you're a freelancer work responsible for a smaller portfolio, Optio can save you time and make life that little bit easier. Hey Jess, how do you use Optio? Well Greg, I love Optio's performance tab for checking in on how my campaigns are doing. It's pretty awesome. You can look at all of your campaigns at once, but it's also ridiculously easy to manipulate the data and see only performance for a specific group of campaigns too. So you just select the ones you want from a list and pow, your data's there. It's much nicer than the clunky filtering options in Google Ads itself, which is awesome. And you can also break out the performance of those campaigns by conversion type, which is huge because a lot of us track more than just one conversion action. So it's a beautiful thing. All right. To learn more and get a six-week free trial and get those POWs in your account, (laughs) head on over to optio.com forward slash S-E-J. That's O-P-T-E-O forward slash S-E-J. And first up in the paid universe this week. Do we have any good news, Shep? We need we need some good news I'm here. I'm trying to remember all my stories. There aren't that many. <laughs> We've oh, got yes, good news. I have a good news. No- Andrea Cruz. One. Yes. Yeah. Andrea Happy Cruz. birthday yesterday, Andrea. Oh, HBD. Okay. So we have an update from our take of the week last week, which was an article by Pauline Jackober. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And Pauline and one of her clients set out to get a 100% optimization score from Google Ads to see how it affected their performance. Spoiler alert, it affected it negatively and they had to end the experiment before they ever got to 100%. Well, Andrea heard that story and responded to us with an amazing piece of wisdom that has changed my life. Changed your life? Wow. Go, Andrea. (laughs) So she said, hey, at Marketing O'Clock, fun fact about Google Ads optimization score. If you just dismiss a recommendation, your score will increase by the same percentage that Google was going to give you for doing it. And that is from her at Andrea Cruz 92 Twitter account. So I think this is great, especially for clients who are peeking at accounts. We can go through and dismiss the ones that we disagree with and we know aren't good recommendations. And Greg said this in our marketing meeting, maybe keep the ones that we've been pushing for. (laughs) This is your landing page. Well, I take umbrage with the fact like you've got these recommendations that you're Google. Why don't you stand by these recommendations and keep them there? Yeah. I've never done this just because I I look at the recommendations and I don't care about half of them. Mm -hmm. They're going to negatively impact things. And I don't care about the score in general because most people trust us. We've had one client that sometimes would hop in and be like, well, why aren't we doing this? And I just have to explain it. But I never dismissed it out of the way because I felt like that wasn't really my job to do that for people. Mm -hmm. Like to just be like, I'm going to dismiss this recommendation that Google gave you. I felt a little weird doing that. So to me, it's like, if you got these recommendations, stand by them. Don't dismiss them. Just leave them. Like, that's weird that you can get rid of those and be like, oh, I'm 100% optimized, even though you gave me these recommendations. I wish they had better recommendations, but I'm glad we can dismiss them. I yeah, get what you're saying. If you want good recommendations, like, go to Optio, not Google. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I get what you're saying on like, 
you know, a theological level that if you were Google, you would stand by what you're saying, but they're not going to have better recommendations. So I'm happy I can do this. I agree. It'd be nice if you could just turn them off too. Yeah. <laughs> turn yeah. them off. Yeah, so thank nice. you, Andrea, from yes. the fabulous co-marketing. And hope you had a great birthday. <laughs> and next up, we have a 21 gets another one segment once again. Ooh, Stephen Johns, 21? Yes. And this is another update from a story from last week. Stephen Johns shared on his Twitter account that parallel tracking for video is now available to manually switch on before the force mandatory option kicks in on March 31st. So if you want to turn it on, you can go into your account settings and tracking and just turn the little toggle bar on. It's super simple. So check that out and get ready for the mandatory change. And finally in paid, we have some aviation news. Google will no longer charge airlines for referral links on Google flights. So naturally they will be removing the ads and sponsor labels from those flight, those flight results. And I thought one quote from this was interesting. Google said that they've always ranked on the basis of price and convenience, regardless of the fact that they were receiving comp- compensation from so- certain airline partners and that that wouldn't change. They were still going to rank it based on price and convenience. But why were they taking money from people? If it yeah, was, that's weird. That's <clears throat> not like, come on. Yeah, maybe that's why they had the 30.4% <laughs> daily budget breakdown of your average spend. Yeah. I'm sure it wasn't to, to make more money. No, it's all price and convenience. So I had a new idea after reading this article for how I think you should be able to rank flights. Can I guess? What? <clears throat> rank based on the number of animals on a plane. No, I don't like animals. Yeah, but you <laughs> less it's a like golf, less is more. Okay. I don't think they can know that ahead of time. Okay. But I like mm. the idea. Okay, I think <laughs> when they have a layover, they should have a little thing that says all of the food and beverage options in your terminal. I love it. So oh. you can compare them. I love yes. it. It's like a score and you, all of a sudden you get T5 in there oh. and yeah. you're like, "Boom, I'm taking that one." User reviews of the terminal. You Love know, it. how much seating space is there at that time? Is there a Chick-fil-A? Is there a Chili's? <laughs> I'll even take a Chili's too. Yeah, and then it looks and it's like, oh, you're going there and it's Sunday, Chick-fil-A off, score down. Yeah. Perfect. So um, thank you for listening to my TED Talk and what is happening in organic. <laughs> well, this week's organic lightning round is brought to you by Ahrefs. Ahrefs makes competitive analysis easy. Their tools show you how your competitors are getting traffic from Google and why. You can see the pages and content that send them the most search traffic, find out the exact keywords that they're ranking for and which backlinks are helping them rank. From there, you can replicate or improve on their strategies. If you're not getting significant search traffic, Ahrefs tools can also help find topics worth creating pages or content on. Maybe you can even get a featured snippet or two. You can easily see estimated search volumes and gauge traffic potential with their Keywords Explorer tool. If you are getting search traffic, use features like their top pages report to break down which of your pages are bringing in the most traffic. Then figure out how you can replicate this success. Shep, how do you use Ahrefs? So this week I was having some fun with the competing domains report to find keyword ideas from some of our competitor sites. So I put in the client's URL and got a list of top competitors for our client's keywords for their site their entire site, there's another one for just pages, and it shows the intersection of the top competitors in like a Venn diagram. Ooh, I love a good Venn diagram. (laughs) Yeah, so you can see, you know, who you're the most similar to, what they're doing that you're not doing, what you're doing that they're not doing, did I say that right? And what you have in common. Um, It's a really useful tool, and then you can dig in and look at the actual keywords they have and get some new keyword ideas. So I can't really use our example of the client, but I did do this on homestarrunner.com. Yes. And wow, <laughs> it's tapped in a time machine and went back. Yeah. So one of their top competitors was fakebands.com. And <laughs> who knew? It's a really great website. And um, their shared keywords were Coach Z, Limousine, and Strong Bad Sings. And fake bands' unique keywords were Buckaroo, Bonsai, Hex Girls, and Hamster with a P. You should look up these fake bands. They're really fun. Hamster with a P. Is that the name of the band or you're just letting us know how it's spelled? That's how it's spelled. It's just hamster. Okay, so lots of fun to be having in the competing domains report. All right, and they have a seven-day trial for only seven bucks. Head on over to hrefs.com to sign up. What's happening in the organic universe this week? Well, Google is going full schema.org in removing others from their vocabulary. So 
In an announcement on Tuesday, Google said they will be focusing on single structured data type, which will be schema.org. We talked about it quite a bit. And what they will not be supporting any longer is the data-vocabulary.org structured data. So that's going to be sunset. Um, and there was an article from Veronica Morrison, front of the show on LinkedIn, and she ran through everything, had an article called Google moving to single SD scheme. So what? Question mark. Broke it down. And I have an article that I'm saying right now in an audible fashion. Google moving to single SD scheme. So what? Period. Boom. <laughs> but again, you should be hopefully with schema.org. And if there's any takeaway, don't put all your eggs in a basket of anybody with a hyphen in their domain name. <laughs> That's that's the takeaway. It's like never trust someone with two first names. Yeah. Like who? Jim Sean Bob William Scott? Duggar. Yeah, Jim Bob Duggar. Mm. Okay. We don't trust him. Only Shep. Okay, <laughs> so next up, CallRail is adding analytics integration with Google My Business. And according to CallRail, My Business provides a limited call insights and no call recording. So CallRail something we love it's a fantastic tool check it out and we co-sign that unless a different call advertiser comes in joking <laughs> um but it will capture the click on the call for mobile devices and right now google my business doesn't report on if the call was answered whether it was repeat caller talk about duration if you want that stuff if you want to record your google my business calls check this out from call rail next up richard falconeer of yard call <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like that would be an amazing thing if you were just a bird handler and your name was Falconeer. I mean, I feel like if that's your name, you should be a bird handler. Absolutely. You shouldn't be an well, SEO. Not Richard. He <laughs> is an SEO that's got all the information because he came up with a study. Again, this is like small sample size here podcast today because he looked at 250 users and looked at the most recent change with the favicons and the ad that shows up like a favicon in the Google desktop organic results. Does that all make sense? Okay. Lots of words here today. <laughs> a lot going on. So Richard led with a car insurance query where there were four ads showing. And in the old format with the green ads, the question was, does this image contain any ads? 73% of people got it right, said yes, and there was a 2% drop-off with the new version. Instead of 73%, only 71% thought that there were ads. So it was a 2% drop. People didn't know at a 2% clip on the world's small sample size. And I thought something else was more telling. That wasn't what he led with, but instead it was with the ad-free search engine results pages. And when there were no ads shown in the SERPs, 58% of people got it right and said, there are no ads here. With the new favicons, people got it wrong. It flipped. For only 42% of people got it right. 58% of people thought there were ads and they're just favicons. That's wild. So I do think we should repeat the study in a couple months when yeah, people are I used agree. to it. And maybe with more than 250 people. But again, it's it's super, super yeah. small. I think with all period. these changes, you like have to learn. Like I'll be clicking on featured snippets in no time. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, it, it looks the same, so it's it, it's gonna. If you're not clicking on them now, you're not gonna click on them down the road. Feature snippets look isn't changing. This is changing. I know, but you just have to learn what that. If I learn that featured snippets aren't in the results again, I'll give them a second. But glance. do you think that the the layman is gonna be up to date on feature snippets not showing in the main search results? I th you, our brains train us in different in weird ways. We're looking at this every day. I think. Any, I, I, my hypothesis would be that normal humans would look at this new favicon lineup and it would be a lot harder to find ads and to know what's going on with all the different things out there. And even on the small sample size, which means nothing, it's so small, you can see that that supports it. The people are looking at this and think that there's ads because there's icons everywhere, but the thing that doesn't have the icon is actually the ad. And I'm sure that they looked at this and weren't going to take this step if ad revenue was going to go down. So I think we're all justified on yeah. this world's smallest sample size here. We should quiz some non-marketers in a few months. I know my mom will 
readily sign up for the study. <laughs> All right, well, let's get 251, 251 people. We'll have the world's largest study so far. All right, next up comes from Bill Swaski of SEO by the Sea, and he is the Google patent guy, and he found a new patent that was approved here in regards to making podcasts easier to find. And so Google has... The, the crux of the patent was that people have difficulty identifying content that they'd enjoy listening to based off of what's going on in the podcast and then the length of the podcast. And so the patent actually has a bunch of good examples there where one is like, what would you like to listen to? Would you want to laugh, learn, or listen? Where, where do we fall on that? Are we laugh, learn, or listen? I would say I mostly laugh. I think we're not. Just being yeah. honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, laughing show, at us, not with us. Yeah, this show's not much of a laugher. <laughs> well, there's listen, people listen. Do they? They actually do. People actually <laughs> make it to the end. It's crazy. Yeah, like, how are you just listening and not, everyone's listening. Yeah, exactly. I like it. You're, just, you're not laughing. You're not learning. You're just listening <laughs> blankly. I'm just spanning time. Just span, hit, span time. <laughs> Buffalo 66. Okay. Deep reference. Deep cut. <laughs> yeah. Christina Ricci, right? Yeah, yeah. Shot right here in Buffalo, yeah. Midland um, Mar Marine Arena, right? Oh wow, yeah, that's like six names ago of that place. Yeah. <clears throat> also, there was a look into how they would do the scoring, which I thought was very interesting. You could see the different episodes, how many listens were there, and then if there were thumbs up and thumbs down, that it would impact the score. Again, this isn't specific; it's just what the patent was showing. So I would imagine that there's probably going to be some sort of thumb up, thumb down coming to podcasts near you. And it's something that you podcasters should listen to, I guess. Hey, try to get people to thumb up more. Because in the example, something that had seven thumbs up and three thumbs down had a score of 64%, where six up, six down, zero. Oh. Hmm. And I don't know, I'm not a mathematician, but 64 seems a lot higher than zero. Both I'll are have to check that. that. <laughs> okay, next up, an article from Andy Cressidonia over at Orbit Media, and he has new research. How has blogging changed? Five years of blogging statistics, data, and trends. And Andy has an in-depth article, a big old blog about blogging. A few of the things that I thought were very good from a takeaway, tangible takeaway standpoint is he looked at the least common blogging tactics that were the most effective. And I'm just going to do a spoiler for the top one. You're going to have to go read the rest. Having 10 or plus images in the article. Hmm. I, I get that. I do like images that, or, or do it like articles that support themselves. And so maybe that just shows there's a level of support as well or level of effort. But um, Or just stuff to scroll past, Yeah, but depending on the pictures. And there's a ton of information. Additionally, there's something I never thought would have happened, but there was a question about bloggers writing short versus long posts. And on average, how long is your typical blog post? The majority in 2014 were less than 500 words, but this kind of crosses this intersection where now the majority of these bloggers write more than 2,000 words. So longer form content. That surprises me. And lastly, Microsoft is going to be forcibly installing the Bing search extension in Chrome for Office 365 Pro Plus users, which I was just on a call last week with a company. I was talking about it was a B2B company, and I mentioned that many people that could be their users might not have the ability to add in Chrome. They might have to use those on their computer, and they kind of laughed at this, and I back Bing up. I, I had Bing's back. And there's another reason where people might be forced to use Bing or might have to use Bing or might Bing without knowing they're Binging. So it's an extension? They're not changing yes. the browser? No. But Microsoft will change the default search engine in Chrome from Google to Bing for its Office 365 Pro Plus customers starting mid-February. So Whoa. if you're in Chrome and you do a search in mid-February, if you're an Office 365 user... At the moment, you will then be changed to Bing, and you might not even know it. Well, Shep will love that. She can get everybody's height very easily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. We got one more, too, here. So Chrome for Android is testing favicons in the address bar, autocomplete, to match the desktop. You're not going to like that? I actually do like this. Oh, you do? Yeah, because you're typing in a website, 
and let's say I start typing in marketing, O, oh, and I see the little clock show up, I know I can just tap that one and get right to it. So there's been a lot about Favicons. I like Favicons. I, I just feel like you don't. No, I do. I do like Favicons. I don't like I don't like the fact I don't like the the fact that you're trying to make it seem like you're not making more on ads. That's what I don't like. Um, but there was there's been a whole ton of articles on Favicons. But yeah, have a good Favicon. Make sure that it's one to one ratio. There are a bunch of examples of people that had huge <laughs> images into their Favicon that just were a blurry mess. But I like this. Yeah, have your favicon, and as soon as you start typing in Android, you might see a favicon and get there quicker. I thought you were going to say have your favicon and eat it. Too. I did too. <laughs> oh yeah, and eat it too. That's it for organic. Jess, what's going on in social? I'll tell you what's app in social this week. Facebook is shifting away from plans to add ads to WhatsApp. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Trying to be smart this week. So that's according to the Wall Street Journal, but. The article in our show notes, which is from Social Media Today, which also looks at the Wall Street Journal article, says that just because they are pulling these plans for now doesn't mean that they're not looking at other ways to monetize the WhatsApp app. So these projects are probably a long way away, but Facebook has apparently been working on ways to bring e-commerce as well as payment solutions right into the platform. So that would be an interesting revenue stream if they start charging processing fees in WhatsApp. So I mean, it would appear that Facebook's objectives are shifting here, but they're still looking for ways to make money, which makes sense because why own something if you can't make money off of it? So keep an eye out as the story develops. And speaking of stories, first quick poll. Is Spotify a social network? No, it's for listening things. I wouldn't call it one, but I love that you can find other people's playlists. To me, if you can't communicate with people, it's not a social network. Well, yeah. you're both wrong. Oh, oh. Wow. <laughs> <Do> tell. <laughs> it is a social network now, sort of. So you're sort of wrong. They are bringing a new stories feature to oh, allow. Yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why I said, speaking of stories, you know, see? So, <laughs> <laughs> the stories feature, though, unfortunately for you, Greg, will only be available to select influencers, but it will allow them to incorporate video elements into their public playlists. Meh whatever some things to note with it you can only see the stories on mobile not on desktop they'll be viewable for all users whether or not you're a paid subscriber for you free user artists will not get access to this feature just influencers and that's because that's it's stupid yeah well it's meant to be more about discovery than promotion but i feel like they would probably get more adoption from it if they gave it to artists because a lot of artists make like Taylor Swift loves to make a playlist for like other artists and just let us know what she's listening to. And it's not self-promotion. She's not an influencer, though. She influences Shep a lot. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> she should be able to do this. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of I think it would be nice for artists. I certainly as someone that's not super into the influencer culture, I don't really care. So I would probably look at it if it was actually from artists. But I don't know. I mean, if I, Slipknot told you to watch a little boy drumming, you would watch. That's what I'm saying. If it came from an artist, absolutely, but not an influencer because I just don't care. <laughs> but <laughs> I was going to do a poll to see if you guys would use this, but I know you're not going no. to. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on. Wait, how come you didn't say I've got something else to explore here? Oh, man. I guess I should have checked with you first on my transitions because that's a lot more brilliant than moving on. <laughs> so I have something to explore here. Changes could be coming for Twitter's Explore page. Twitter product designer Martin Craster, that's at Mark and Craster on Twitter, is soliciting feedback from users, which I think is nice, on how to improve the Explore experience. On Tuesday, he tweeted, do you use Twitter Explore within magnifying glass emoji? If so, let's talk. Why do you currently use the For You tab? What would you like to see or expect to see in your For You tab? Do you use any other tabs within Explore? If so, which ones and why? And DMs are open if you prefer private. Oh, DMs are open. Great. <laughs> so I don't have Martin's password, so I wasn't able to check his DMs, but I did take a peek at the replies that are coming in, and there's a lot of honest feedback in there about people that are not feeling like the content is relevant relevant to them in their For You tab, and they want to be able to curate topics themselves, too. It's not. It's like Ty Pennington runs your Explorer. Yeah. You, you, you're an extreme home makeover. The Carpenter? Yeah. You ever seen that show, Extreme Home Makeover? 
and some little girls out there. I'm like, I like ladybugs. And then he's like, oh, I got a secret room. The little girl comes back in there and (laughs) the bed is a ladybug. It's a mouth of a ladybug. (laughs) Everything is red and black. She is in red and black attire. It's just too much. This is an amazing analogy. And you get an explorer and you you click on one thing about football and it's like, do you like the Jacksonville Jaguars? Do you like the Chicago Bears? And I'm like, no, 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 no. So you would agree with this user that feedback. That's such a great analogy. It stinks. I'm not, it's like exhibit. How about that? In, mm. in the Pimp Your Ride. Yeah. Where I somebody be like, I like, a, I like fish. And then your entire car is a fish tank. You have to put a snorkel on to drive <laughs> down the street. And it's insane. And that's what Explore is. So there yeah. you go, Martin Crasher. I'll so DM it over to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's all duggers. Yeah. It's duggers. You know what, though? Mine, with a lot of irrelevant stuff first. But after five scrolls down, I got to some things that fans of the show know I'm into, like rock music and metal music. And, Greg, weather. <laughs> Casey, help me. (laughs) All right. Sticking with Twitter here, you can now add emoji reactions to direct messages on the platform. Super exciting. Twitter announced this new feature on Wednesday and call me an early adopter, but I totally used it already. Shout out to Glenn Gabe, friend of the show. He sent the Marketing O'Clock team a funny message, which inspired me to react with a little laughing face. Jess, how dare you? I Call him just friend of the... He's BFF BFF of the show. show. You're right. Excuse me. Retract. Glenn Gabe, BFF of the show. Retweet. Retweet. That's okay. So we talked about this at lunch today that kids are saying this now and Shep is telling us it's been happening forever. The the IRL of retweets? Yeah. Yeah, I just speak for the youth, you know? You do. You're very youthful. So hip. I agree. Retweet. (laughs) Retweet. (laughs) So (laughs) So dumb. (laughs) Okay. Next up. Facebook was hit with a class action lawsuit by developers over a loss of access to social data in 2014. And if you are interested in legal stuff, you should read this one. It's a doozy and I'm no lawyer. So. Nobody listening to the show is interested in legal stuff. And if you Perfect. are a... Ever heard of the CCPA? <laughs> <laughs> What's that guy's name? Ever heard of the it? Guy that got the C- CCPA. I'm going to look that up right <laughs> oh, here next story. Yeah, what is I'll it? I'll be right back. Let's see what you got next. He had like a fancy murder mystery name. Yeah, well, you look that up while I go through. Basically, some Mc- folks are... McTaggart. <laughs> Alistair McTaggart. <laughs> yeah! How did you remember that? I would never forget right. that name. Shout to Alistair if you're listening. We love you. <laughs> All right, so some folks back in the day made some apps no one had heard of. It sounds like they're super jealous of Facebook's success. They blame them for killing off Google Plus, whatever. There's a lawsuit. Yeah, that's, that's the problem with Google Plus. Uh, yeah. Because Facebook <laughs> killed it off. These people are angry. The whole thing gave me a headache. Go read it if you're interested. The problem with Google Plus was Google Plus. Google didn't support it. It stunk. It was so hard to use. It was a nightmare. And then there was, all, there was so many issues with Google Plus. It wasn't Facebook and it wasn't Alistair McTaggart. Retweet. <laughs> <laughs> the plaintiff did allege, though, that Google Plus had a lot of support. So it's still Facebook's fault. I... I don't want to know what business this plaintiff runs because I don't want to use it. I can't even imagine the support that they have. Dating apps and credit score slash identity verification. That's what they were up to. All these apps are, I mean, you've never heard of them. Trust me. Anyway, lastly, here's something you may have heard of, IGTV. Instagram is getting rid of the IGTV button on the home screen because apparently no one is clicking it. And when I read this article, this was the first time I even knew about said button because I've never clicked it. So that's good. They're getting rid of it, but they're not getting rid of IGTV, just that home screen button. So if you still want to get IGTV content, you can get it from your feed or directly from profiles. It's still there. It's not going away. Just the button. And that brings us to our real life segment, straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for Working Hard or Hardly Working, where we talk about what's going on in our IRL work, good, bad, or otherwise. Shep, what's been happening with your accounts lately? I have been working on a pretty lengthy piece of content for download basically all week. And I had to research a lot of SaaS companies and like be educated on what they did. Question, (laughs) these SaaS companies, did you have a dream at night, wake up, and then just be like, oh... Here's the SaaS company. I was dreaming about SaaS companies. That's how much I was working on this this week. But I just realized how many people are like so bad at what explain explaining what they do on their website. And it's really sad. And people should just be aware of that and show their site to people who are going to give honest feedback and be like, what do I do? I was watching this SNL skit where people were like, what's my name? And it was people you should know their name you know, like someone you work with. Okay, whatever. You had to be there. But anyway, (laughs) they should do that with people's sites. What do I do? They should have a translator, a SaaS translator that you could have in a Chrome extension. You go to the SaaS site and you read this. 
Hey, we align their synergies and workforce no. productivity, and you just run it through the translator. And like, translate. We what do chatbots. There you go. Boom. <laughs> Done. I love it. Yeah. What is happening with you, Jess? So I am working on building out a remarketing campaign for a client. I was trying to create some audiences in GA and combine specific content that users may have visited on the site with the days since their last session, and which is a dimension in GA. And GA told me that that audience, even though I was able to create it and get as far as trying to publish it, that it was ineligible for both GA and Google Ads as destinations. So there is a workaround. Obviously, you can create multiple audiences with the you know day since last session and the content and create custom combinations in Google Ads. But kind of a bummer that you can't just do it all at once in GA. I feel like that would be really nice. So if you're listening, Google, maybe think about that. Greg, I what about you? They're listening. <laughs> not, <laughs> they're not, not, listening. not after the first 40 <laughs> minutes or so. All right. I've got something great. LinkedIn support. We had a page for a SaaS product that we had. Maybe you did a little research on that this week. We had lost control of it due to an employee not with us anymore that had, had started it and didn't give everybody access. I went through LinkedIn support to regain control of this. Phenomenal. Honestly, they were responding with human responses in 30 seconds of me posting a thread. It was insane. I was flabbergasted, and it just gives me so much more confidence in telling people, telling advertisers, telling anybody to invest in LinkedIn. It was mind-boggling good, especially after the seeing the at Google Ads account and that horrendous support and teleperformance and Regilex and everything. It's just so nice to have people that care and can help you out and do things. It's phenomenal. That's nice. Yeah, a little human touch <laughs> goes a long way. Now it's time for this week's WTH. Misguided. You're like, who does that? <laughs> Just get rid of it. I'm over it. <laughs> Where we rant, rave, and roll our eyes about our trending digital marketing topic. What are we coming to? Honestly. See what had us asking. W. T. H. This week. This week's WTH comes from CNET, and it is a doozy. There is a new app called Clearview. AI that lets strangers find your name and info with the snap of a photo. I took that from the headline, by the way. This is going to end well. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently this is being used by hundreds of U.S. law enforcement agencies right now, including the FBI. The app works by comparing a photo to a database of more than 3 billion pictures that Clearview says it's scraped from Facebook, Venmo, YouTube, and other sites. Venmo? Do they have your picture on Venmo? I don't use it. Some of them. Hmm. But like, what do they need from there to know if people are charging you and you're not paying them back or something? Just <laughs> trying to see any illicit activity on Venmo that you're yeah. using. Oh, oh like, like paying people for who the get devil's paid for Ven from Venmo and don't pay taxes. I don't know. You just see. I mean, if you could just pull up anybody's Venmo after you're taking a picture of them. Who knows? That's a little spooky. Well, this whole thing is spooky. So this is not available to the public yet, thank God. <laughs> yet, though? You use the word yet. I'm, I didn't mean to use the word yet. Oh, There's okay. no plans to release it to the public, but there is plans to re release it to police departments. But there's so many people in police departments. Like, <laughs> this just shouldn't <laughs> exist at all. It's problematic. I mean... I just don't want something like this to exist. Like, it, it could be released to the public. This is like Minority Report or something. Yeah. I don't just, want you to have any of my information, especially my Venmo information. Just get good at face manipulation. Start being one of those makeup artists. Actually, mm -hmm. my Venmo picture is me drinking out of a paper cup that like makes my nose look really big. Like the cup has a nose on it. Can you picture that? Yes. yes. So they wouldn't know what they would think I have a huge nose. Oh, you're going to well, get away I with do, so many but things. Bigger. Yeah, you do not. <laughs> yeah, maybe I will. I mean, all somebody has to do is hack this though, and then we'll all be able to use it, right? Yeah. Yep not putting any ideas in anyone's heads. Please don't do that. All right, next up is our segment segments called the Petri Dish, where we workshop through segments and find things that may work or may not. It's anything you've got. So if you ever have a segment, throw it in the Petri Dish. First up, going viral <laughs> from the Petri Dish. Segment going viral. Everybody always comes and says, well, I need to get something to go viral. And we've got some fail-safe ways you can go viral today. And so this week, there's a new trend all the kids are doing on TikTok. So you as a brand, maybe you got a mascot or somebody can just do this trend. So what people are doing on TikTok is eating cereal out of the mouths of others. So get your mascot. I want to leave the earth. <laughs> pour a little milk in the mascot's mouth no. and eat cereal out of the mouth. Boom. You're I, viral. I need to be excused. <laughs> okay. Remember that doctor that was advising people on health issues on TikTok? We need to get her on no, top of no. this. You, no, you got to go viral. <laughs> 
in this case, maybe quite literally. Who knows? Oh. So next up is a preemptive don't do it department. <laughs> so we used to have the don't do it department. And anytime something big comes on, we bring it out. There's a preemptive one. I'm sure you're going to see people recommending bypassing featured snippets because we talked about it. There may be a drop in click through rate on the featured snippet. You can get out of that by using a no snippet tag. Hold your horses, everybody. Wait. So don't do it if somebody's telling you, run no snippets on everything. Don't do it. We saw meta descriptions go double to 320 on average, up from 160, and then revert back. We don't know what's going to happen. Things might change. Don't do anything crazy or drastic. Calm down. And as Aaron Rodgers said, relax. <laughs> when did he say that? He like spelled it out, I think, right? I don't, I don't know. know. Do you know that? Di- I don't like sports like you, like Twitter says you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I saw it in, uh, after I X'd out the Jaguars and they gave me the Packers. Okay. Next up, get rid of it from the Petri dish here. Get rid of it. And it's the Mr. Peanut account on Twitter. I can't stand this. Are I'm, they gearing up for something? They have to. I think they're gearing up for Super, the Super Bowl, Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a huge thing on Twitter where Mr. Peanut was driving a peanut mobile. Saw an armadillo in the road, and in the car is Wesley Snipes and this Chris Elliott cabin boy looking guy. I thought they oh were God. just a couple of dudes. No, it's Wesley Snipes, who apparently is out of jail, and <laughs> some other person. So Mr. Peanut swerved around the armadillo, and everybody got out of the car, fell out, and were on a branch hanging over a cliff. And they're talking about somebody should jump, and then Mr. Peanut commits suicide. And kills himself. He sacrificed, could say he sacrificed himself. himself. <laughs> well, he chose to jump down. Isn't that the same thing? Yeah, but it, it's a nice, it's like put nicer and it's more okay, admirable. I, maybe I was they totally concerned. stole the idea from Toons as the driving cat. What? I have no idea what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Is that English? <laughs> you don't know Toons is? He's always playing those bongos. What? what? <laughs> I can't retweet that. I have no it's idea what you're really talking about. It's a really old SNL skit and it's really good. Oh. Anyway, so there's a whole hashtag called R.I.P. Nut. <laughs> and there's even a little icon of a monocle. There are so many questions. A, they fall out of the back of this car after the swerve. <laughs> They're all in seatbelts, though. So I thought there was a crash, but somehow Mr. Peanut's driving swerved instantly out of the back of the car. It's all the worst production quality. I don't know who made this thing. It. I looked at it, I was like embarrassed for this, this company. But everybody's retweeting it. There's... Movember, the Wienermobile, WWE, Captain Morgan, Tums, Klondike, Kraft Mac and Cheese. They're all in on this thing and thinking it's funny. And it's like, I don't get it. And every time this stuff happens, I'm so it's so cringy. Like Oreos is giving them high fives. And it's like, this guy just offed himself. Yeah, I don't think it's funny. <laughs> and you're, It's just stupid. It's so dumb. I think, yeah, they just, they spend all their money getting Wesley Snipes. So production value down. I don't know if you know about Wesley Snipes, but you don't need to spend a lot of money. He's, he's not expensive. Oh, he's got some tax problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. It's not funny. I'm laughing. Anyway, it all makes me super cringy. It's super skeevy to me, but I just say get rid of it. And now for this week's Cool Tool. As a reminder, our Cool Tool segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something we found in our travels that may be of use to our listeners and is really, really cool. This week's Cool Tool isn't technically a tool. It's a report template, but it is cool, so we're doing this. So this week, Local SEO Guide published a blog post and step-by-step documentation on how you can aggregate and automate performance reporting with Lighthouse and Google Data Studio, or in layperson's terms, easily pull site speed performance data into a dashboard to help you surface actionable opportunities for improving your site. So we've got a link to the post in our show notes if you want this. It's, I think, an eight-page Data Studio report. It's really nice. You can look at their example that they made. And uh, yeah, head over to the link in the show notes or to the blog at localseoguide.com and check it out out now it's time for our must read marketing article of the week an article so advanced so in-depth so detailed that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show and this week's must read marketing article of the week comes from our own mark saltarelli here at cypress north and if you're bitter about it and you don't want something that's our own go check out andy crestedonia's Orbit Media article we talked about earlier. It's great. It's a good read too. But Mark talked about something that is very pertinent in today's times. We talked about the removal of third-party cookies coming in two years from now. 
and Mark has an article about CRM retargeting and why it's a necessity for B2B digital marketing. So get good at this now. Again, those third-party cookies are going away and just go full scar and be prepared for the coming changes. <laughs> so Mark covers what is CRM retargeting, how it's different than pixels, what are the advantages of CRM retargeting, the core applications in CRM advertising, and how to incorporate CRM remarketing into your digital marketing strategy. And Mark has an amazing, he joined business Twitter and he has the best handle. Did you hear it? Yes, it's Mark. Mark underscore from underscore MKTG, Mark from marketing. Mark from marketing. It's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, go check that out. Thank you, Mark. All right, that does it for today's show. Thank you to Ahrefs. Optio, our fabulous sponsors this week. And if you're looking for another great podcast, don't miss this week's episode of the Search Engine Journal Show. And this week, Danny has on the Ryan Jones, who talks about SEO at agencies. He's got a bunch of use cases, a bunch of SEO fails, WTF SEO, which is the onion of SEO. I'm not sure what the WTF means, though. <laughs> Where to find? Who knows? And he also talks about what he would do if he wasn't an SEO. Hint, sounds delicious. So check that <laughs> out. It is now officially not marketing o'clock. Remember, you can catch everything from today's show on marketingoclock.com. While you're there, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week.